Hello, welcome to Happy Horror Time. My name is Tim Murdoch. And my name is Matt Emmert. Now, today's special guest starred in two of our favorite 80s slasher films, Hell Night and Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter, both of which have developed huge cult followings since they were released. In each of these movies, he played a nice, respectable guy who treated his love interest right. But unfortunately, that didn't stop Andrew Garth from throwing him out a window in Hell Night or Jason Voorhees from crushing his head in Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter. We're so excited to welcome to the podcast, Peter Barton. Woo! Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate it. How's it going? It's going good. I mean, it's it's been a while since I've done any acting, but it's, you know, I've been I've been a dad for the, like the past 16 years. And that's kind of like that's been my role in life for, you know, since 2006. My daughter is like in 11th grade and I spend all my time doing school activities. I was a coach last year. For the track team, I was coaching pole vaulting because I used to pole vault in high school. I used to do like 12 feet. So the girl, one of the girls I coached won the sections. She was a section two champion up here in uh, upstate New York. So wow. it's, it's, yeah, it's just been a- it's Congratulations. Just, yeah. You know, taking it back to the very beginning, Peter, we read that you grew up in Long Island and were about to attend medical school when you decided to pursue acting and modeling instead. So what led to that big change in career path? Well, originally I was supposed to be like, my dad had a business and I was supposed to go into that business, but my dad was, you know, kind of out of control and, you know, he was a construction guy. So very rough and means, you know, I, again, he passed in 2016. We, we, we got along good to, at the end, at the end there, you know, there were t at the end we were great, but I had a lot of problems. So it's like, basically I went back to school. I worked out of school, like washing dishes and busting tables. And I went back to college and my major was pre-med I went to Nassau Community College, got a two-year degree, and I was transferring into St. John's for, I was, I was transferring for pharmacy. I was going to get my pharmacy degree and then try to become a doctor, which eventually I became one of the Young and Restless. So that was <laughs> If you can't but, be one, at least you can play one on TV, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> so I was paying for my own schooling. So I basically went into the city to see if I could model to make more money instead of washing dishes and busting tables and being a waiter. And I started modeling. And they had a TV department at this, you know, this agency, you know, it, was, it was Zola, it was called Zoli back in the day, like this is 78. And I, I didn't even want to go. They, you know, I, I was asked to go on an audition for, you know, a, a TV series with Shirley Jones. And I never acted a day in my life. So I was like, I can't act. Like, and they were like, <laughs> Peter, we're sending everybody, just go. And it was a role that like, uh, the kid was like having a conflict with his dad. And it was like, I read the script. And I said, this is what I want to say to my dad you know, you don't love me. You never cared about me. And it was like, you know, like that, again, that squeaky clean kind of, you don't love me. I, I try. I love you. Oh. So, anyway, so I got it. And that kicked off my career. That's how I fell into acting from, a, from basically my going into my third year pharmacy school. It's like, next thing I was on a plane going to Los Angeles to start with Shirley Jones, because they were looking for like the next, next David Cassidy. Isn't what? that awesome? Because like when you were doing that show, it's like we had NBC, ABC, CBS, and now we've got like 900 channels. So <laughs> everyone was watching your show. Yeah. Back, you know, back then it's even like young and restless when I was doing young and restless, like in 88, there was only like three networks still. We used to get, they used to get like 12 million people a day watching that show. It's like 1.2 now or something. Yeah. I, I was also going to say, by the way, you, that story of how you got that job is like every actor's dream. It's right. like, didn't do acting a day in my life, got asked to audition, got the first role and bam, I'm on a hit TV show. Like that is incredible. <laughs> well, I just, I just, I want to say just like at the end of the year of like going out there and having no experience where after I did the pilot, they thought about letting me go. And then the producers loved me and they fought for me. It's like at the end of the year, by the time I went back to Long Island, after a year of being out in, in Los Angeles, my hair is falling out. My gums are bleeding. I was so stressed out because, you know, I was also on the cover of like every teen magazine. You know, they yeah, were like so making the next teen star. And I was like, like what, you know, my, I, you know, it was like just too much. I was yeah. Like, I was just about to ask you in the Crystal Lake Memories book, it says that you were on a lot of teen beat magazines in the early eighties. And how did that come about? And was this before or after Hell Night? Yeah. How did you get this on suddenly? Right before, right before Hell Night happened, they were looking for the next thing, you know, like Sean Cassidy was like fizzling, not really, they couldn't find anybody. There was Leif Garrett, there was, you know, so it's like Leif Garrett, you know, even Eric Estrada, they were using him from chips and stuff like, you know, so next thing it's like they were looking for the next best thing. And I was like the perfect that 
boy girl look that they loved and it's like they just you know started pummeling me on every cover of like 16 and you know and i i, I didn't you know and again i had like so little experience in actors so it was like you know i was always waiting for them to find out like wait a minute this guy can't act let's get him out of there man no don't sell yourself short yeah you're a great actor and like i have to ask when your family is like all preparing for you to go to medical school and then you get like the acting job in these covers of magazines were they supportive or were they like what the fuck are you doing (laughs) my mom was the best of the best without my mom i don't think my life would have happened i mean total supportive you know crazy my dad watched the the pilot episode of Shirley and called me and said, I've seen you act. You'll be driving a truck for me soon. Oh, <laughs> that's encouragement. I'm sure that made you feel <laughs> extra special about yeah, pursuing I'm this. It's like, thanks. You know, it's like, you know, you know so I, 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 wrong. I proved them wrong. I had like a 30 year span there. So I proved them wrong. Yeah. And, you know, so we always ask people this. Um, one of our, um, you know, constant questions, because we're a horror podcast growing up, were you a fan of horror movies or at least were there any that kind of like made an impact on you that like stuck with you in your head? We, My friends and I, when we hit like seventh, eighth, ninth grade, there was like the last house on the left. Ooh. There was like all the ninja movies, like all the all the Bruce Lee, like all the like the there was like there, there was like these the, before horror hit. There was like these torture films with, you know, where they had the thumb screws and all. And I, you know, yeah, we would go and we would love we like 10 of us to go into the, you know, go see those movies. But they were, this is before the horror, really, before the first Halloween hit. You know, this is like they were doing a different type of you know, gore back then. It was like, yeah, you know, we, we have never heard last house on the left before. That was a first. Everyone answers the, the exorcist as the movie that stuck oh, with them. Oh, oh, senior year. I went into the city with my girlfriend, my high school girlfriend, you know, with a, a, two couples went in that movie freaked me out. Yeah. I was like totally freaked out. Cause I kind of like, kind of believe in like, you know, spiritual craziness and that totally, yeah, that was like, that movie was freaked me out i was like you're not alone i would say 90 percent. everyone's and speaking of the exorcist so you know moving on to the 1981 slasher film hell night now we've heard you say in interviews that you didn't really want to do this film at first because you decided kind of at that point you were done with acting but then your co-star linda blair who of course everyone knows from the exorcist talked you into doing it so what we wanted to know is what led to you being kind of so over the hollywood scene so early in your career I, you know, just like, uh, like I just, when I just said that I got so stressed, Yeah, I, I was like, you know, I was like on highs and lows. I mean, it, but thank God I didn't do drugs. You know, I was like, I was totally against, my dad was kind of a, a drinker. So I was against like, dr- you know, I was against drugs, but I was on a roller coaster, man. I, I could be like high as a kite, like just naturally. And, th- and then go into like, you know, David Bowie, like in the corner, like scared to death, you know? So I, you know, after doing the Shirley thing, and I was, you know, knocking around. NBC put me under contract. They did a pilot for them. I got to do. I I signed up to do a Facts of Life. Like, well, they 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 called for me to do a Facts of Life, right? I went to like two rehearsals, like with the girls and and Charlotte Ray, and freaked out. I freaked out. I couldn't <laughs> do it. I was like, I can't act anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. And I had to go to the. They made me go to the producers and tell them I'm done with acting. And like, and this is exactly when Hell Knight's coming in. And they, Do you remember like, what episode you're it was? Breaking Tim's heart because he's like the biggest facts of life I fan. So if you can life. remember I what think, episode, I think, I think, uh, what's his name? Greg. He was another teen star. Like he, he felt he took he took the role. What was his name? Oh, Greg, I don't know. Do you remember what the storyline was? <laughs> I, I remember. I remember. I was like gonna date Blair. And, I love it. Okay, and uh, and I was a shyster. And I, and Charlotte Ray knew it, and Charlotte Ray knew that I was okay. Scared. I'm gonna get back to you on that because I've seen every episode. Tim's gonna find out the exact season and the yes. episode number for you. Well, it was it was it was Hell Night year, so it's like 1981 before, like no, no, 19. We did Hell Night 80. in 1980. Oh, so okay, it was like October of 1980. I was like, I'm quitting acting. I'm okay, like, I'm gonna do a little research. So then, how did you then come around to finally like saying yes to Hell Night and getting involved with that? So here we go. So now it's like they want me to go to Hell Night and they like they're telling me like I, I think maybe I had an audition or somebody met me and they wanted to see me again. And they said, no, you know, you're going to go and meet Linda. And I said, I don't want to do it. I'm done. And they were like, well, go and tell them you have to go 
and tell them that you don't want to do the movie. So I went there saying, I don't want to do this. I'm like, oh, done. And, and they're like, oh, let's go have some lunch, you know? And Linda, Linda is like the nicest of the nicest. I mean, Linda Blair is like, you can't say enough great things about Linda Blair. And she was like, come on, we'll just go to lunch and hang out. And we, you know, we went to lunch and I had a glass of wine you know, not, you know, and we went back and they go, oh, we'll just read, let's just read it. Let's just read some, like some of the script. And I was like, at that point, I was like, it was so nice. I was like all loosened up and stuff. And next thing I, I you know, I, I do that. I get in my car and like, I get home and it's like, they want you. I was they, just about to ask you, like, what was it like working with Linda Blair? But it sounds yeah, like she yeah. was a dream. Did she, did you ask her about she the exorcist? Or, I mean, I feel like, did, did oh, she? Oh, it's surprising. Feel- I didn't ask her about the exorcist. I didn't <laughs> ask her about the exorcist. I like that like never even came to my mind. I was like so like, you know, tunnel vision about like just being on the on, you know, doing the movie. We went out to Redlands for like a month. You know, we used to like drive out to Redlands in that mansion and, you mm-hmm. know, sleep all day and work at night. And Linda Linda knew I was so freaked out when like when we worked in Los Angeles, she'd come to my house and pick me up in her car with her, her with her, you know, her little corgi and like, you know, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, every she'd come to my house and pick me up because she knew like how freaked out I was. And that she is, still loves animals. Yeah, she's everything is about animals. So it sounds like that's been her entire life. How strenuous was the shoot? Because, you know, you and Linda in this movie, obviously, you're running within the house. You're running in the maze. You're running through the underground tunnels. Was it a really strenuous uh, shoot? Well, I you know, for, for me, it's like I was like a, a person that goes out and runs like at that point to channel my energy, I'd go to go jog three or four miles every day just to like keep myself like, you know, like, so strenuous. Yeah. Cause it was, it was always like every scene was like, you, you know, you were always out of breath and like being crazy. Right. And like people don't get like, I get like when I see actors doing this stuff, I mean, I, I kind of like my jaw drops cause I, I, it's really work, man. I mean, to actually do that kind of, you know, and try to portray being terrified, you know, nonstop. It's, 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 it's a tough gig. It's emotionally draining, I can imagine. And, yeah. and is it true there were only two corridors that you had to run through over and over to make it look like there were a bunch of underground tunnels? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I was like, I kind of forget, but it's like, yeah, that, that wasn't too big. They kept on like going from every angle, you know, like and just running down the same thing again and running down the same thing. Yeah, it is. They, it wasn't a big, it wasn't a big, yeah. It you know. sold it though. Yeah, like, we until it. we read about that, Peter, I thought you guys were in the biggest underground like, this, tunnel. This I've set ever is seen. impressive. That was all built like at, at like I think Charlie where Charlie Chap Chaplin Studio was, whatever that place was, that's where it was. Like right in the like oh, park. Wow. So, okay, so now on to the biggest controversy of this film, whether you really got hurt after being thrown down those stairs or whether that limp you have afterward was because you put a rock in your shoe, because I feel like I've read and heard both. So what do you remember in terms of how that scene went down with you being thrown? What I remember about that scene being like, I don't I I don't remember being hurt. I don't remember getting hurt, but I did like like to try to like authenticate something that would remind me that I was supposed to limp all the time, that I did put a rock in it, like a, a huge rock. So like if I put any pressure on it, it was like, ow, ow, you know, so I the rock in the shoe is the way I, I go. It's like I didn't really I didn't get hurt falling. It really hurt my leg. It was the rock in the shoe that. I love IMDb trivia, by the way, because anybody can submit anything. So literally, like I could submit and say, like, uh, Peter uh, hurt his wrist on the set or something, you know. <laughs> and and how about the scene where you get thrown out the window? Did you almost get hurt during that? That I almost got hurt doing because it was like elaborate, the whole harness thing. And when he picked me up and threw me, my head just missed hitting like the the, the window going out. So like if that, that probably could have been a mess. Like, you know, who knows? I mean, like I, maybe I could have gashed myself or like, you know, because we still had a lot to shoot at that point. I mean, basically we had to do all the outside stuff when I'm laying there dead, which was like four o'clock in the morning and it was freezing. And that night I was drinking, I don't know what I was drinking, peppermint, peppermint schnapps or something, you know, because it was so, you know, that was like an hour and a half, two hours laying there in the freezing. It was cold. Red no, I believe Wait, it. Did, did Linda ever drink with you on set or was she very kind of like straight edge? I don't like, you know, we, we, we all hung out and we're very friendly. Like we were a close knit group. I mean, that's, that's the year I, Lennon died. I mean, like I remember sitting in the trailer and we, we all heard that John Lennon just got shot. We were like, oh. you know, you know, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of pot, uh, like Kevin Brophy was a, you know, a heavy pot <laughs> smoker, man. I mean, he was, you know, he did that. He did the whole monologue, like totally wasted. I mean, he'd smoked so heavily, like, you know, like, 
tie stick, whatever, you know, I, one time he had me, I took a drag off it. Like one time I was pissed off because, you know, or like, I don't know, it was late, late at night and I had to do that. We were going back in after Jason got crazy. Like, you know, we were had me and Linda were outside and I go, oh, we have to go back in. And she's like, what? But I was totally, I took one hit off his tie stick and everything I did, I was like paranoid about. I was like, is that okay? I like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, you know, I couldn't, I like, would, I would be gone. I've never done anything. Yeah. Tim is very fit. I have had, Bravo. Bravo. I've had my fair share of marijuana <laughs> in my life, but I will say, if you're already worried about something and you smoke, it like amplifies it times 10. I remember as a teenager smoking once and then seeing like a car coming by and be like, is that the cops? Is that the like everything that you may be afraid of is amplified? Exactly. That's exactly. And then the other time I did a drug on the on the set was they, I, you know, because I was so afraid of my lines and everything. This is like, I'm still like, you know, so they gave me some lines when we're going after, I'm like, I'm going down with Linda and, I, and, I, and I, I stop and I turn to her and I go, she's like, we got to go back. And I'm like, no, we have to go deeper. We have to get, and it's like, it was like two lines they gave me, right? But I was so pissed off. I'm like, like, they're going to shoot it in 10 minutes and I got it. I don't know what, you know, like, what. so this guy who became my friend gave me, like, he was like, what's up, dude? And I was like, like I got to do these lines and he's like come here let me help you out so he gave me like a little cocaine oh yeah the 80s and, drug of choice right and bottom line is I mean I think that was the best moment I had in the whole movie like I didn't, <laughs> you didn't even have to act you know you know like cocaine it was like I was like no we have to go deeper it was like you know it was like I, I when I saw it, I said oh that's like not bad no wonder no wonder actors get hooked on that stuff and like, now you know. did your dad see hell night and did he change his opinion of you with the acting after that or no <laughs> no he, he he didn't change his opinion to the mid 90s when i was doing burke's law like he <laughs> finally he finally gave in to me and said i guess you made it <laughs> <laughs> after i did after i did you know like Matthew Starr and like eight years on the young and I mean, six years on the young and restless. Then I got Burke's law. Then finally, like 20 years into it, he's like, Oh, I guess, you know, I guess you made it. <laughs> and and when you saw hell night for the first time on the big screen, what did you think? You know, they had it like, they had the cast get together. We went to a movie theater with like, they brought us as, as a cast to watch it as I remember. And it was pretty like, you know, I mean, I was always uncomfortable with myself. Like, you know, it wasn't until The Young and Restless that I started like going, oh, that wasn't bad. You know, like I, I started giving myself a little break, but I was so critical of myself early on. I couldn't watch myself. I was always like, oh, I was just like, oh, like, you know, I just thought I was so bad. And like my like my dad was right. He was living in my head going, you see, you're oh, going to no. drive, drive a truck soon. I told you, you know. <laughs> He, like hearing that constantly yeah, in your I've head. Never heard. You're gonna you're gonna drive a truck for the rest of your life for me. Oh for me. god. You know, um, we noticed in Hell Night in the opening credits that you get like the coveted and Peter Barton spot. How was that arranged? Because that was your first movie, right? Yeah, how did how, yeah, how do you you know? I just think I just think maybe because I was pummeled into the you know, into the teen world, like the magazines, maybe they were trying to, you know, they were trying to use whatever they get to more, you know, get as many people in there to see a movie as they could. Because, yeah, you would think Vinny, like Vinny Van Patten would have got that, you know, because he's like, you know, he was pretty accomplished at that point. He had done a lot of stuff. Is he currently married to Eileen Davidson? Yes. Yeah, from, oh, she's yes. on The Young and the, is she on The Young and the, Yeah, she's on The Young and the Restless yeah. yeah, she And she's been forever, too. Yeah, she's, she was like, also on House on Sorority Row. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are, yeah. are you are you still in touch with Linda Blair at all today? Do you guys ever talk, or has it been too long? I saw her at like a, one of the the horror, uh, you know, signings. Like you know, back it's probably like at least seven or eight years ago. But you know, it was great. I, there's a picture of me and her. Like you know, somebody took a picture, and it's on like Pincrest or whatever, wherever they are. You know, <laughs> but yeah, she like it was great. I mean, like I I can never say enough about Linda Blair. I mean, like. As far as I'm concerned and how she was with me, she was the, you know, the best, like one of the best experiences for what, like for what I needed at that time, caring. I mean, you know, being like, you know, supportive, like great. Right. Because no, I mean, I'm guessing Hollywood's not always so sweet. And also no. I, I can imagine. No, yeah. no. it's like Zach, Zach uh, Gallagher. Uh-huh. You know, like, you know, good old Gremlins boy. Oh, like, Zach Gallagher. Zach Gallagher. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, go, okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so I love him. You know, I love him probably like uh, when I got to know him, like whatever, but those are the type of guys that if, if, if I showed up on the set and I was unsure of what I was doing when I was younger, they'd eat me alive. 
Uh-huh. They would have fun with me. Like, cause I got to know him personally and, and he would tell stories about the people they would really do that to. And I'd go, that's so mean. Yeah. I would be, I would oh, be collateral damage. That's, that's hilarious. So, you know, um, uh, jumping forward a few years to the fourth and what was supposed to be uh, last film in the Friday the 13th series, the final chapter. Now, we know that you've said that Amy Steele, who was your co-star on the TV series, The Powers of Matthew Starr, and also one of our favorite final girls, um, talked you into doing this film. So what we wanted to know was what did she say to convince you and what made you kind of reluctant at first? Well, more or less like Amy is like, you know, I, I, I fell in love with Amy, like, you know, as my, as the co-star on, on Matthew star, like when she, you know, I was in love with her, but she ended up marrying Peter Pulitzer, but it's like, you know, it's like, I instantly fell in love with her. She just had some kind of chemistry that like, just, you know, just mesmerized me. But so we, you know, it's with my trust in just basically her, you know, that I knew her for so long. And I had this, you know, that, that, you know, an opportunity to audition for this. And she's like, oh no, it's, you know, they're all really good. And Frank Mancuso was the same guy who produced, you know, who produced her movie. So I basically went there, you know, and and again, it wasn't something that I was like, I was still neurotic at the time, but, you know, I I went to the auditions and I sang, you know, uh, this, what, what the shower song was like, uh, every every like sting song every 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 breath she every move you make oh every, that was supposed to be that the was the song that was the song sing like tangerine yeah because yeah. they were too they were too cheap to buy the rights to, to uh to you know to like have to pay like a real artist for some so they like they you know we, I ended up singing tangerine you know tangerine she I'm is surprised awesome. they didn't have you sing like row 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 your boat like, just sing happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. um, so, wait, wait, that was your audition. That was just, they just had you um, sing the song. No, no, we I did. I had to do the whole the whole bar soap thing. Like, but it was like you had to start off singing though. You know, oh, wow. I had to start off singing. You know, so every move you made, you know, it's like <laughs> it's like uh, it's like. But anyway, so then and then it was like one of those things when you come into work when they're going to do the scene, they go, "We're not going to use that song because it's like why." Because they're too cheap to buy the rights to it. Oh, it's yeah. Because like, what's it cost? Like $10,000? I can't even imagine. Probably. Who knows and what the, you know, they have to pay. So Amy obviously had good things to say about her experience on it. Because we got the chance to speak with Amy. And like she, yeah, like, I mean, she's become like in that series, like one of the most famous final girls of that series, you know, through how many movies, Tim? 13? Thir- thir- I mean, yeah. well, I think there's 12. Yeah. Jay- yeah. Versus Jason. yeah. Oh, um, I was going to ask you when you got the role, did you go back and see Friday 13th, one, two or three in 3d? <laughs> Any of them? Let's see. Did I go, you know, I don't remember. Like I, I re- like, I remember when I got the thing for Shirley, it's like, I had, a, I, I, I couldn't even watch the Partridge family because I was so terrified. I was like, I'm going to work with that lady. It's like, I know it's like, but I don't remember. Like I started watching the Friday 13th after I, after I did them. Yeah. After I did them, but I didn't see like, three like the three day one i didn't even i've never seen it in a three day I did you see amy's TV. yeah had you seen amy's i've seen i went to amy's screening because she was doing she was doing uh matthew star with me at the time when that came out so like i actually went to paramount with her and saw the screen like one of oh, those. that's awesome okay so you're like, like and i'm gonna be in the next- again you know but i like i was blown away i mean i think amy was so good in that she yeah, was she really is. good. She was yeah. really good in that. So was Linda. Yeah. Linda was good. Like Linda was really good in Hell Night. Like Linda yeah, yeah, good. no, exactly. And you know the the final chapter was directed by Joseph Zito, who, after reading Crystal Lake Memories, we found out was apparently a bit of a polarizing figure in terms of how he handled things with the cast. What was your impression of Joseph Zito and his, what his directing style was like? I don't think he ever really paid attention. <laughs> to me. Yeah. That's an honest you know, answer. You know. It's like basically, you know, maybe I was too much in a cocoon, but like whatever I was asked to do, I would do it. Like I would have been the same way. You probably did you interview Judy Aronson? No, we not, not yet. No, no. We've talked to Kimberly Beck from part four and um anybody else from part not, four? I don't know. So. Did Kimberly, did Kimberly ever mention like our that we had a relationship? We no. I don't think no, I don't think we knew that until we saw like a post that you made. I think I didn't even know you guys were engaged after Friday the 13th. After Friday the 13th. So crazy. Because like, she was in a different storyline that I never even like, but I like I just wrote today to a friend who like posted like that thing I posted. I saw Kimberly like in 1979 doing a Buck Rogers, 
And she was married to like Barry Hilton, the son of Yeah, Hilton. that's so interesting. <laughs> and I was like, and I, I I saw her and I was like, oh my God, she's like the most beautiful thing I ever saw. And the, and the and the guy said, she's married, forget about it. So now I do the movie with her and it's just like, hi, hi. And I never talked to her, but I was totally like, stars went off in my eyes, like whatever. And then I bummed into her at a park that I used to jog at. And she invited, she said, you should come to my acting class. So I started going to her acting class and that's how I got to know her. And then like three months in the acting class, I was like living with her for the next year. We, you know, we got, we were engaged. That's you know, so that's crazy. Up. And it didn't happen from you guys being in the movie together that it happened after. Well, you know? She was working with Eric. You know, like the guy, you know, she was like, she was in a whole different, like we had a whole different storyline. We never even saw those guys. Yeah, yeah. because I mean, you were in two separate houses, like they were in the cabin and then you guys were in the house that was built specifically for the movie. Right. So it was I have to ask you a question because Kimberly couldn't answer this. Was there a basement in the house where you guys were filming? Did they build a basement? Like, because remember E. Erickson goes downstairs and he's like, he's, he's killing, killing me. Yes. He's yes. Killing. Like, he's was killing. there a basement? No, there was no basement in our house. It's like that house, even like the bathroom scene, there, there was no, that wasn't a bathroom. It was like they had like a hose running in for the water, you know, was and it they cold? had and the, yeah, and they had the smoke machines going and the girl, you know, Barbara, who was, you know, who I actually, you know, fell in, like and uh, doing the show. Like I actually like fell for her and like, you know, we were <laughs> hanging out like, you know, together. So she did the close ups, but then they brought in a body double because she wouldn't do it. She's like, yeah. I, I'm not doing nudity. Well, yeah, that was what I was going to say. We read in Crystal Lake Mary's Barbara Howard just said no to being nude in that scene. So they used a body double who literally was just there with you to be naked. So was filming that scene awkward? And did they make you be fully naked in that scene with her, too? They 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 actually told me, could you talk to her for a while so she could try to make her comfortable? Like, you know, then, and she's like going this. That was her big break. She's like telling me like and I'm like, oh, my God, she's saying this is her big break. And it's like they're just using it for a body. And then so we get into the shower and it's cold and it's like that's the smoke or whatever they use to make that smoke that make the steam. And then I'm like, I go in, I got like flesh colored, like, you know, bikini underwear on. And, you know, and I'm like in the shower and it's like and they're like. We can see that we can see the bikini underwear. You got to take it off. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and like, you know, then they're like, they're like, there's like the crew and they're like ex- instructing me. It's like, all right, all right, turn her, turn her butt on the, put it on the glass now. All right, like lift up her leg. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> it was like, it was like, that was like, as, as just as, you know, as she, like, I felt so bad for her. You know, like, you know, it'd be like if it was Barbara, it's like, yeah, we could, you know, it's like we, we kind of knew each other. You know, we had this it was part of the movie. Right. And but, she's playing a full fledged role, not right. just naked girl well, in shallow. In 2022, there's intimacy coordinator. So I'm guessing back in 83, there was not. No, yeah. no, no, no. That was like that was like one of the worst moments in my, you know, it's like I felt so bad for her. It's I mean, such a quick scene, though. I mean, it's like and I feel yeah, like it took, it took like probably an yeah. hour and a half to do. Oh, I'm well, sure. And I feel like even like a question like asking you to remove your underwear would have to be nowadays. They'd have to like clear that with your agent, dude. Like, you know, but back then like, they're just like, hey, take it, take it off. Like, we can see it. We can see that we can <laughs> see that. We can see it. You got to lose the underwear. Take that off. Like, I will know. say that probably made it easier for her that you were embarrassed and naked, too. Do you know what I mean? So she yeah. didn't have to be full because if you get to wear underwear and she doesn't, that sucks for her. Was it? Was it did Joseph Zito at least say it's a closed set? Or anything? No, no. It was like I, I got every. I'm sure everybody, like you know, she had an attractive body, so I guess everybody that could get in there was. Oh, oh God. no! I so know. you know, shortly after having sex in this movie, big surprise, your character meets his demise by getting smashed into the shower wall and having his face crushed by Jason. How was that whole sequence filmed, and how much did they actually have you in there versus like a head cast? Because uh, Ted White seems to be a very, you know. It doesn't look like he's going to be gentle. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like he's going to be gentle, but like he's the most professional. Like when you when you interview Judy, you'll find out he's the one. She was like, you know, going in like just, you know, in that water, like that lake. Hypothermia, and, right? Hypothermia. Yeah. Freezing. And he was like, he was like, either you get her out of there or I'm quitting. Like he was like, he, she can tell you the story. He was like her knight in shining army. He he saw that she was hurting and he wouldn't have any of it. So with me, it's the same thing. He was John Wayne's. John Wayne's like a stand in. So, I mean, you couldn't find anybody more professional than, you know, and I got and I got to, you know, I got to do a couple of autograph things with him, too. And he was just 
you know, the nicest guy, you know, classy, old school, old values, you know, all that stuff. So he was like, you know, moment by moment, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I did all of it. I did all the feet. I think I did everything except when they put the bust in, you know, on my face, like crushed the face. You know? Wow, that's I mean, yeah, because it, it looks good. Yeah. And, and Joseph Zito has said that he wanted your death to be because you have the prettiest face, like to be like, I thought that was really nice. I was like, wow, that's I, I didn't like my face. Tim had to tell me that. Did you know that he said that? I kind of heard, yeah, I've heard that before. Like, you know, that 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 they thought that was I don't know if that's the way originally, I don't know if that's the way I was supposed to die. I mean, I I, I wish I, I you know it's so bad that I had that script and then you know, I don't know what happened to it. Like, I would love to have the original Friday the Thirteenth script. I mean, like that I had. That'd be so cool. With your um, notes on know. it on the side. Yeah, because I always wrote, you know, scribbled stuff like you know the analogies to something that happened to me in my life or whatever. But I, I would love like, to just see it to see if anything was different. You know, like if obviously, like you said, if your death was different, the initial script or something. I used the machete. Yeah, I wonder if like I'm wondering if like you know, I think they might have came up with that, like that idea to like, you know, my face after they cast me. I think it could have been a different way I got killed in the shower. I, know, I love that. Here's a pretty face. Let's crush Let's it. Let's crush this pretty <laughs> face. So after the film was finished, was there sort of a cast and crew screening or a big premiere? No, I remember going back east. Like I remember going with one of my friends from high school into a movie theater and watching it in the back, you know, like sneaking in and like watching in the back. But I don't that one. I don't remember like Friday the third. I mean, uh, Hell Night. They had a thing like, uh, you know, Bruce Con Curtis, the producer of that was really like flamboyant. And he it was old Hollywood. And it's like and I just talked to him like months ago. I don't know how old he is. He's got to be approaching 90, but he's still the same guy. He still wants to do a sequel. He's like, I got a sequel lined up, Peter. We're going to bring you guys back and certain things. But, you know, it's like so he's, he's still talking about a sequel of it. But it's like so he did that on purpose to have the cast to at the screening but i don't remember the friday the 13th I it was remember. it was paramount's biggest opening in 1984 and yeah. a lot of people see it as the best sequel in the series like i mean i'm not just saying no, that no, like it, like a lot of it's known across people at like a lot of people i think frank frank mancuso said yeah, that he I, thought it well, was because it was supposed to be the final so they were just yeah. like let's throw everything in this movie and it, it was it's a good movie and i do have to ask peter and you could be completely honest on this have you seen any of the friday the 13th movies that came out after the final chapter did you see five and six and seven and eight i've i've seen like i've seen bits and i've never sat down like especially the one like right after when when you know when the you know the, the, new, one, beginning. Right, the new beginning i saw that like saw that because you know i want to see like kimberly's in a little bit and like whatever but then that one girl what's that one girl who's so attractive and i i, I met her and she's another i mean they she was like what's her name is it melanie kinnaman the star no, of five no, no. Yeah. um Jennifer no. Cook, part six, uh, or Lar Park Lincoln in part seven. <laughs> I think was you choose like didn't uh, like the uh, uh, Scott from from Young oh Never that's uh, Jason takes Manhattan. Oh Jensen Daggett, right? Yeah. Jensen. Yeah, she's she so oh my god! I did a golf thing with her, and I was like, oh my god. I was like, you know, just so like starry eyed about her too. It's like, I, I'm so that actress we fall in love with. Any, I was like, you know, just put us. It's like, oh, like chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> she um okay. fun fact she was in uh episode two of melrose place season one wow <laughs> oh really yeah what? so two just to like a just to like a guest <laughs> just star? she was she she was a, she had a love scene with um andrew shu she came in she said hey jason yeah. is in manhattan everyone i gotta and, go and left <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay so we have a little fun game planned for you peter where we're just going to ask you some quick questions and you simply have to answer with either hell night or Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Now, don't worry. Most of the questions are just kind of to pit the films against each other, in your opinion. Only a couple have like actual fact-based answers. So you just have to answer with Hell Knight or Friday the 13th, the final chapter. And you have to say the whole, just kidding. No, no, no even reason <laughs> if you don't want. Okay, so first, which do you think is the better overall film? Friday the 13th. Ooh, Ooh okay. I agree. Uh, which have you seen more times in your life? Friday the 13th. Okay. Which had more drama on set during filming? Hell Night. Oh, oh. okay. Okay. Maybe the shower scene. Impressive. <laughs> yeah. um, which had, uh, okay. Which, okay, sorry. I can't read. Um, <laughs> which had more behind the scenes romances? Friday the 13th. 
Really? Okay, yes. we may have to ask you about that, but it's good to know. <laughs> Bigger cast, so I could see that. Um, which had a villain that you actually found scarier while filming? Hell Knight. I, I agree. I, I never met him. He didn't want to be around us. Really? I, yeah, and he was good. I mean, like, he was a stunt guy that they got to do this. And I, that dying scene, I mean, he had no acting experience. He was like a kung, a kung fu guy. Oh, and wow. He didn't want to be around us. He didn't want to, like, he wanted to do his own thing. We never even saw him until, like, he was, like, working, you know, coming after us. I agree. And for people listening to this podcast who've only seen the Fr Friday the 13th and not seen Hell Night, you should definitely see it because, yeah, like you said, like, the villain is just really freaky looking. Like, it's just, I don't know. He, I, I totally agree with Jason that. Jason without his mask. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Um, which do you get asked about more by fans? Friday the 13th. Yeah, I figured that one. Okay, so if you could pick one film of the two that your character would have survived through, which one would it be? It probably would have been Hell Knight. Like, you know, they they had trouble killing me off. Like, you know, like they 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 actually even talked about that near the end of the film, like thinking about like should they really kill him off? Cuz like, you know, I was like so squeaky clean, why well, it's like what like one kiss is going to get me dead. Yeah, I was totally surprised. I was, I was like, why did I, he I would die? say that too. I would answer the same, not that the quiz is for me, but because <laughs> like, well, you're in front of the 13th, you're one of the many people, you know, you have you break the rules and have sex, whatever. But in Hell Night, you're so nice to Linda Blair and you're with her through so much of it, and then you get killed. Yeah, yeah. I to the coward right at the end where I'm like, Marty, Marty. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like and then the bam. like I sound like a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I probably would too. Um, which has more cast and crew members that you're still in touch with today? Oh, Hell Knight. Hell Knight. Those guys, that was like interesting. It was like, because it was so early in my career. And it's like, even the crew like would hang out with the cast and not so oh. much Friday the 13th because they were more professional. This is like, you know, you know, they're like fourth one, you know, whatever, the final chapter. But Hell Knight, it was like, and you know who like produced Hell Knight? Well, you know that probably like Chuck, Chuck, he did the mask. With, oh yes okay oh chuck yeah. russell yeah chuck russell man that was yeah. like you know and all those guys i mean like the whole cast and crew would hang out we'd actually go like the bars and stuff and hang out oh. do you are you in touch with any of the friday the 13th cast members or crew members today well kimberly doesn't like my politics so she doesn't want to talk to me on facebook <laughs> Corey or how about, how about Corey feldman crispin glover dude well, go dancing. Corey did like burke's law i mean they brought you know, Corey did an episode of Burke's Law and, you know, there's a like Crispin I haven't seen for 20 and I saw him on Melrose one time. But everybody there's there's definitely a connection because when we were like doing the movie, when you're doing these projects as as you know, when you're younger, you get close with the you know, you become friends with everybody. You know, we we, we hung out. So there's a there's definitely like a, a high school vibe, like from when you go to college and you know these people when you see them, there's a, a connection that you have with them. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a couple more questions in the quiz. So these have actual answers and see if you know this. Which film's shooting location was featured in Fleetwood Mac's 1987 video for their hit Big Love? Well, I would think it's Hell Night. I think You're it's right. It's the Kimberly Crest Mansion in Redlands was in that's their like video. Amazing mansion. Yeah, that's why I went right there. It's like, yeah, that's like. Yeah. Um, which film had a higher budget? Friday the 13th, the final chapter or Hell Night? Friday the 13th. Yes, the, the, it was 2.2 and Hell Knight was 1.4. Yeah. And then our final question of the quiz and our favorite, which of the films features the very memorable line, it says you're a dead fuck. <laughs> oh, that's Lawrence. Lawrence Monison. <laughs> Lawrence. He's turning. He was said, you know, like there were how old was he? Was he like 19? It was so young there. And he was like, like now, if you like just see his transition of, you know, him as a young, you know, or a man now, it's like, like he was this boy, like total like boyish there. And then turn into this, like, you know, I don't even know. It's like, he's just like more, more like to me, he's always like so macho and like whatever he comes across as like, the, you know, Lawrence. And I I still come across the same way, kind of, you know, I'm <laughs> like, I'm basically the same I was back then, but he's like totally transitioned into this. Like, you know, right. you know, back then he was goofy. He was goofy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like to be goofy anymore. He's goofy back then. That's right. Funny. I mean, he people always say like my transition to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh yeah, definitely. I've seen it completely. <laughs> it's funny. Cause Lawrence is um he, I think he looks, 
the youngest of the people in final chapter. Like he, he just looks yeah. so young, like a teenager. I mean, I guess he was though, but yeah, he was. And he was, yeah, he was. And he, and again, his relationship with Crispin or like, you know, they, they, they were like, they were like good. They, they carried their scenes. Yeah. And yeah. Were, no, like, it's definitely they were entertaining. A- fun yeah. memorable line so we just have a few wrap-up questions for you peter um so and you've talked about some of it um here but so you've mentioned in interviews that you dated some pretty well-known stars in the 80s and 90s if you don't mind telling us like who are some of the stars you had romances with other than you already have talked about a few well i i love that you know again i got i got to like hang out briefly with amy i got to after like in 84 i actually got to had a romance with uh uh, Julianne Phillips, who was Bruce, Bruce Springsteen's first wife. They yeah, last yeah. Was she in Fletch Lives? Is yes. That right? Yes. yes. That's I, her. I know. She That's was her. also on yeah. the TV show um, Sisters. Yes. Sisters. She, yep. She yeah. played. Yep. So that was all my, that was my 84. And then I basically fell in love with Kimberly in 87. And we had that going on. And then in 80. Actually, I had this thing in 88 with Kim Gillingham, who did Captain America, blah, 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 blah. And then that I was and I was crazy about her. She was like, she just had my number, whatever. And then then I moved then Lisa Renna, like we, we went from like 89 to like 92. Well, I have to ask, did you watch her on all eight seasons of Housewives? <laughs> <laughs> I had trouble. I, you know, I would, I would, if she's on, I would watch her, watch it a little bit just to watch her. Oh, but, she's on the Housewives. Well, she, she just does. left, but she, I can honestly say I saw her in every episode. She, um, there's quite a lot of drama around her. I think she's funny. <laughs> that is funny. I take well, She's exactly a- what she wanted to be. I mean, like Lisa used to say, like, one of the things that we'd have is a thing, like, you know, I was happy to just get work and like make a living at it. Right. And she, she was like, I want to be bigger than Madonna. And I would go, why? But she wanted, she wanted fame. And you know what? She made it happen. I mean, she yeah, really I mean, did. being you know? a housewife for eight years, that's pretty impressive because I mean, you have to keep the drama higher. That's what I was going to say. Fire. You have to keep the fighting going. I mean, you know, it's a reality it show. So. <laughs> I can't even have one confrontation with Matt. I know that's what <laughs> I'm, I'm getting the feeling, Peter, the, are you the type to fall in love like really hard, like, like quickly with people because. <laughs> and you know what? I was so fortunate to have be around, you know, so many great women who, you know, who they had careers and we kind of lifted each other up. I mean, thank God, you know, there was, you know, there's always drama, but it always seemed like we went higher. We didn't drag each other. Like sometimes you see relationships and people go into the dredges, you know, they just, they aren't good for each other, whatever, <laughs> you know, I, you know what I just watched, I just watched, uh, What's her name from from uh, from <laughs> blanking out? I can uh, help you. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like I, I, Pamela Anderson. I couldn't. Come oh up yeah, with did it. you watch her documentary? Oh my god, she yeah. is like the most authentic. I mean, I couldn't believe. And like they ended with her doing, you know, uh, you know the the play on Broadway. You know, it's like doing Roxy. You know, it's like she. I mean, I never even knew like how I met her once. Like. Out in Malibu, she came over when she was dating Kid Rock. You know, somebody knew her that I was with and she came over and they were like, you know, just really. But like watching that documentary, I was like, wow, she was really something to me. I was yeah, like, yeah. her son like helped her out. And he's he the son was saying, like, I can't believe my mom only makes four thousand dollars a year from Baywatch and like how like she's the biggest star in the world. And, and I thought I'm, it was fascinating. And I'm glad that she did that to like get her story out, because especially after like the Pam and Tommy, you know, oh, show. Yeah, Seth- and everything yeah. so like that she got to have like her voice heard you know yeah and 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 the way she just present like so authentic mm-hmm. i mean she would just say like you know she would say any like you know oh, yeah i was a whore then and like but i mean she was so authentic and it, and she wasn't i mean like she was just the same way it's like if if you've had you know it's like i kind of you know i relate by just falling into it and like going through the whole thing and you know having these love affairs along the way and whatever and it's like she's the same way i mean she was always falling for the next the next guy the next guy but it seems like she has that thing with tommy which i would i would i would go either like for me it'd either be like kimberly or Julianne Phillips were like the ones that like, I just, I wish, you know, I just want, I was too young. I was like, yeah. or like too crazy. I mean, like, not that I was like looking for other women, but it's like, I wasn't ready. 
You yeah. Know? It's, no, all, that, it's that, all in the that, timing. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, another thing we read about you that was I found incredibly fascinating was that in 2012, a man named Ray Folk left you and your Hell Knight co-star Kevin Brophy, like his entire $1.3 million estate, even though he had never met either of you. Like, that's unbelievable. Can you tell, like, how did that all go down? And what was your reaction? I got I got a letter from the lawyers out in, you know, in Illinois, like Springfield, Illinois, saying that I was in this will and I was named the will. And I, you know, my dad, right. My dad saw that and he was like, that's real. And I was like, my brother is like, yeah, yeah, that's real, whatever. So I, I, I talked to Kevin, he already heard. And Kevin's like, I can't believe it. Can you believe this? And I'm like, going, oh, Kevin, if it's too big, good, too good to be true, it can't be real. Right. So, so now I, you know, Kevin had six kids. I mean, Kevin had a big family and, you know, he was parking cars at the Beverly Hills hotel his whole life, like to make ends meet for his family. And I was like, I'm going, like, I jumped on a plane and flew there. And like, you know, the guy, the lawyer picked me up and took, took me out to the farm, 300 acres going, here's your farm. Like, I'm like, and I'm like, nobody's contesting this will. And he's like, he's specifically named his relative saying he wants to leave them nothing, you know, because they were like, you know, they were like undermining him. They were like not, they were mean to him when he was younger and they were like cousins and stuff, whatever that was, you know. So it all turned out to be legit. And basically Kevin did a, a series in 77, like Luke and the Wolf Boy. Mm-hmm. And I did the Powers of Matthew Starr. So this guy, I found his diaries, like he had like stacks of diaries and he used to visualize like astral projecting like my character and and he loved dogs he like lived he thought he was like part dog so lucan he just resonated with these things and in his will it said i'm leaving my estate to my friends kevin brophy of the san fernando valley and peter barton of valley stream long island so it's like he totally like you know related to what our things like he thought like we knew like what he knew I, I don't Thank like, God I, you did that TV well, series. No, well, I'm just like, I don't, I'm trying to think my reaction. Like, I feel like it's incredibly moving, but it's also a little creepy. Did you feel the same way or? I never like, I, I don't remember like responding to him, but Kevin had letters from him oh. and like, and responded, never met him, but responded to his letters and like wrote back to him. So when we went through his stuff, we found stuff that Kevin, like letters that Kevin had wrote back at me, but we didn't find anything on me. So Kevin was always like, why are you giving anything? <laughs> so, was it, an so was it just like an obsession with the characters or was it, so was it, do you think it was more an obsession with the characters versus you guys or, or was it an obsession with well, the two actors? Matthew had powers, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's what he thought. Like I read his letters where he thought he, like he would talk to his mom in the letter saying, I astral projected back to like, this is when he was in Germany in Vietnam, like s- fixing cars over there, or, like, you know, doing some kind of thing. And he would say that he would astral project back. So this is like the early sixties, Matthew started and come out to 82. Oh so he was God. astral projecting back in 1963, you know? Did, wow. did you ever have to like talk with his family? Were they pissed off at you and Kevin or? I never met any of his family, but we went out there and we had, a, we had a, a friend of mine, Chris Millis, who, you know, wrote this movie, you know, he had Billy Crystal in it and James Caan. It's like uh, a small, small apartment, like what's it called? Small apartments. But we, he did a, we did a script and we went out there and we invited everybody in the town. There was like 300 people showed up in the town to thank them. And like through like a, a, like a, a, you know, thing, a, a tribute to Ray Falk there, but nobody, like nobody came. That was their opportunity to like come with pitchforks to go, no. <laughs> and they did. So they've just stayed silent, I guess. They just stayed silent. They did. Wow. And I never, thought it was gonna, I never thought it was going to happen. I like, you know, you know, there was like when it goes to probate or whatever, the six months. And I was like, this ain't going to happen. But at the end of six months, nobody contested the will. And it was like it just went through. Wow. So, well, thank you. Thank so you. Kevin, so Kevin and I both walked away with like six hundred thousand dollars. Oh, oh my God! I hope that, someone's out there listening to our podcast. No, I'm just, I know, I know. <laughs> hey, um, if you're a fan of Happy Horror Time and you happen to want to leave uh Tim and myself some money, hopefully, feel, hopefully feel we brought to, a smile to your face. Yes, feel free to do so. <laughs> oh, um, you just never know. I mean, here it was. You know, this is two like 2006. I come up here. You know, my daughter's born, right? And the you know this is 20, 2012 now, 2012, yeah. and I'm like. I'm like, you know, just getting further and further away. I can just, you know, it's like, you know, it's year after year goes by. And it's like, well, I guess. It's, and all of a sudden it's like, next thing I'm doing, Strange Inheritance, 
2020 does a piece on it. Suddenly Rich from the TLZ, you know, TLC, they all do pieces on, on this, this weird story. Right. And it's just, I just think it's like so weird. It's like, I was like, you know, it's the same way as like when I went to hell night to say, I'm not going to do the movie. I, I, I can't do this. And it's like, I'm always going like, you know, I still go pinch me. It's like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of craziness that went along with this too. But I mean, how fortunate, you know, I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm grateful. I'm just, you know yeah well congratulations I and mean, it, um you know people like matt and i we attend horror conventions uh do you attend many horror conventions and what's the most common question you get asked i don't even know like what the common question is I mean, like you know like i find the like when i do those horror conventions everybody's so nice i mean like th that whole world of people are just you know they're just fans and they just you know love i remember i met this one girl who's like on the Shriner commercials, this blonde girl, she's like 16. She sings on the commercials now. She came over to me when she was like four. She was there. She's wearing an Elvira wig. Uh, her last name is Williams. And I told her back like 20, this is like 20, 2012, whatever. Now she's like a young lady, but she wanted to be an actress. And she's like four years old. Her mom was with her. And I was like, you know, and sometimes I go, isn't she a little young to be watching these movies, <laughs> whatever. But she's actually become this like amazing, like she does like bits on the Shriner commercials now. And it's like amazing to see. So I just, I don't really remember anything that, you know, the questions that somebody would ask me, but just everybody's so nice. They're just yeah. so nice, you know, and I haven't done one in a while. It's been probably a couple of years since I, I only did like five or six of them. Well, can we say as fans of horror, fans of uh, these movies and fans of you, fans would love to have you back at these conventions. And and you're right, like people are so dedicated, especially to the Friday the 13th series that like they yeah. just get so giddy at being able to see and talk to, you know, the people from their movies. So if you get a chance to, you know, we'd love to meet you at a convention someday, like in person, obviously. So we had, a, we, you know, they had one where it's like they brought like they brought like a bunch of like. I, it was Kimberly, Judy, Eric, me, Lawrence, Ted. And then they had like other, other, you know, other movie, like some from the, you know, from two and from like, you know, I think was maybe Amy was there too, but they had a really big one where it was like mostly all of Friday the 13th. But usually there's like three or four of us when I'm there, but I'm all like, again, Judy did like the girls get more because the girls are just cute. And, you know, they're just <laughs> guys love the girls. I mean, I don't blame them, but you know, it's like, so Yeah. Sean, like, what's the guy's name? Sean. He like Scott Reeves. No, or, not Scott or, Reeves. I'm just saying the guy that books them. Sean. He's oh, uh, Sean Scott or, or Sean. Um. Uh. Yes, the guy who does the convention. We, we Sean Clark. Sean Clark. Sean Clark. Yeah, he's always like he's the one that always like he, I've always done them for him. Like he just like once in a while goes, "They want to do one." I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like and sure. I, and I wonder when do you think you first became aware of the huge fandom behind the Friday the 13th series? Like, like meaning in your, obviously when you did the movie, did you know it was as big and did you think you'd be like, talking about it, it? Did it go away for like a good 20 years or was it always there? No, it went away for 20 years. You know, you never knew, like, you know, this is the one thing that still is like, you know, reality in my whole career. It's like Friday the 13th, you know, little did I know when I was doing it, I thought I was just, like, I thought I was going to do the last one. I thought that was cool. I'm going to do the last one. That's cool. But I never, yeah, it's, it's become the one thing, you know, that people like Friday the 13th, they love, you know, they love that or, you know, or you, the, the soap world loves, you know, young and restless, they yeah. love it too. But, but Friday the 13th is one thing still. Yeah. And it's still like one of the things you get paid for. If you did all feature films, it's you could make a pretty good living tv i get love boat from 1984 i get 10 cents you know <laughs> <laughs> that's but friday the 13th i like make like 1500 dollars because they run it at you know at halloween every year and you get see 1500 dollars off that you know so if i did all movies if i did 50 movies it wouldn't be so bad yeah yeah no that's a good point and and we also wanted to ask you um so what are you up to today we read that you work or worked in the fitness field no, that's I always put that in there. It's like because I've always worked out, I guess, because I'm oh. like I've always been like I said, I'm, I'm I'm coaching the pole vaulting over at the high school and my daughter goes to now. But it, it's like nothing. I've just like kind of like been biding my time until she's like she's graduating 11th grade. So it's like I'm going to be on my own. I am pretty much right. She's got a boyfriend for like two years. So it's like I'm pretty much on my own anyway now. Oh. But it's like that's why I'm like, actually, it's it's just so fun to go to L.A., and maybe the, 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 you know, going to the young and restless thing. Cause I like, I haven't been around. So it's going to be fun because they're all still on the show. They've been there since the, like the eighties. 
Yeah, wow. just, soaps never stop. They never oh, ever yeah. stop. They're still there. They've had yes. like their grandparents now. They had families on it. Now they're onto the, you know, it's like crazy. So that should be fun. You know, I, I, I'm kind of, that should be fun to like go out there and like, you know, I've been out there since 20, since COVID, all that stuff. I haven't been there since 2019. And oh, you wow. said this is the 50th anniversary of Young and the Restless? 50th anniversary. You were on it for six years. That's great. I, I mean, they yeah. uh, the amount of people that have probably rotated through that show in 50 years, I'm sure they could fill a convention center just with actors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, they, but they've been there. There's a baseline of like, you know, the, the, the girl I was like, Tracy Bregman, who plays Lauren. I mean, I was married to her twice on it or whatever, but she's still there. I mean, she's been there since she's a teenager. You want to hear something funny, we, Peter? We interviewed her oh, for this podcast because she was the in the original happy birthday to me was her first she was the killer in that horror movie it's another 80s slasher so we actually interviewed her for the show couldn't have been sweeter yeah she just posted it too i think there was like she posted the cast like a picture of them hanging out She's like, oh, somebody sent me this like recently. So maybe like how long ago? Did you just do an hour? We did it a couple months ago and we're going to be releasing it um, um, soon, very soon, because we always release um, interviews like a couple months after we do them just because we plan ahead on the podcast. But um, yeah, so that it's really funny that you mentioned her because we had chatted with her. Yeah. Um, So, I mean, obviously there's soaps, but would you ever do another horror film today? You know what? I would like, I don't like, I don't know what, like, I, you know, again, I would never like plan on like saying I'm, I'm, I'm act, but it's like, I just don't know my life's that way. It's like, I don't know. It's like, am I going to like, I love upstate New York, right? In the summer, I don't like the winters here. So, you know, I have a condo a mile from Beverly Hills. Am I going back in the, in the winters? Yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to, you know, it's my daughter's in school. She's going to be in college. It's like, I won't be like, you know, I'll be like, okay, time to close up this house and head out, you know? So I don't know. It's like, I, I feel like, can I do a can I do a commercial for you know, you know Cialis? I don't know. It's like whatever. <laughs> you know? It's like can, I mean I, you know I, my hair's my I have to cut my hair, but it's like you know it's it's like you know whatever. It's like can I? I would think that I could get a you know get out there again. You know, yeah. I think I think you I, should walk into the Young and the Restless looking exactly like your character. <laughs> I, I actually think, look, a lot of people, a lot of horror stars we've talked to, it's like when their kids grow up, sometimes they like it's like they find this newfound like second wind to try acting again. So, hey, I wouldn't rule yeah. that out. Maybe we could see you in another horror movie soon in the future. Hell Night well, 2, your friend wrote it. Even, <laughs> yeah, but he's if, dead. <laughs> oh, that's true. You fell out of a window. <laughs> even if even if it's just like, you know, hey. It's like doing a cameo in, in in Bruce's you know remake of Hell Night, where I just come over as a waiter and go, hey, "Can I help you out? What, what do you need? Or anything?" Yeah. You know, it's like I you know I it's it doesn't like I never wanted a big part. You know, I never really wanted to like I always ended up being like the co like you know every series I did I was like oh co star. It's like I couldn't care less if I was just doing you know the it's easier to do the guest spot because it's not really on you. You know, they only see you, you. You seem to be a better actor because you're only in brief scenes and it's like and then you're gone where when you're like on the show the whole time, you can like watch and go, oh, like, wow, well, it's like, yeah, it's like a different vibe. It's a different vibe. <laughs> so, Peter, we have one final question for you. And we ask this to everyone we interview again. It's kind of like one of our staples and it's going to put you on the spot a little but um, um, we'll give you a little time to think about this. But. The question is, what is one thing that you can tell us about your experience, either working on Hell Night or Friday the 30th, the final chapter, that you've never told any other interviewer, publication, convention, Q&A, podcaster, just one thing about your experience working on either of those movies that you've never told anyone before today? And it doesn't have to be like the most gossipy yeah, thing, just something you've never it's not told. for a scandal. It just, yeah. You know. But if you want to start a scandal, hey, it's, it's getting, but but just one thing you've never told in any other interview about oh, okay i never told this i never told this i, I i've told this to people but it's like because I, I was kind of ashamed of it like so it's like but linda blair had a party at her house near the end of no it wasn't near the end of it was like it was right before this like the seat the party scene when like we where i'm sitting there with Vinny van patten and and like you know linda walks into the room and he's like i'm like hey look at that man and Vinny's like looking at suki like swinging or you know and it's like that night linda had the night before that Linda had a huge party at her house, like whatever. I got wasted. I was like so drunk. I was so drunk. And I was like making moves on Suki. I was like trying to get her to like get her in bed with me, like, you know, and she would have nothing of it. She was like, no, no, it's like whatever. So I got all I got all mad. Like I was drunk. So I, I was mad. And I jumped in my Honda, my my B210. I had a hatchback Honda and I start driving home. I'm, I was wasted. I mean, like my whole life could have changed that night. You know what I mean? It could have been over. 
could have been over. And I'm driving through Laurel Canyon, and that's a oh my that's, gosh! I drive it every day. Yeah, but and it's like right right before you get to the light, there's that big turn. Yes, oh, I okay. lost it. I I weaved out into the other lane. I was going into the valley. I was going into the valley. I weaved out into the other lane and cut it real like a car. An on carbon car was coming. I cut it back and I smashed into the curb, and my tire, my front tire, got bent underneath my car. It's three o'clock in the morning, right? Now I'm now I I'm I'm still driving it like three miles an hour. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> like over the hill, down the hill. I'm like going down the other side, right? I'm like just boom, boom, and like no cops, like nobody, like right now. I'm I'm basically maybe a quarter mile from from uh, Ventura Boulevard. The wheel flies off, and I oh. skid into the curb, and I skid the car skids into the curb. Oh my god! In the morning, I got to work tomorrow, like six thirty. Three o'clock in the morning, I'm wasted. Wow! I'm looking, I look around, right? I'm looking around. I'm like, well, this is like, and now I live in North Hollywood. I live in North Hollywood, so I got another like, you know, four or five miles to go. Yeah. And three o'clock in the morning, a cab. So, a how cab! did you get home? How did you get home? Did you call AAA? <laughs> oh, a cab, a cab, a cab. This ain't with this 1980. There's like, there's no phones. We, there's no such thing as a phone. A cab. A cab three o'clock in the morning has its lights on. I'm like, I jump in the cab. It takes me to my place, you know, North Hollywood. And I had a motorcycle at that point. I had like 400, a 400 Hawk. And I, I, the next morning I got up and still like, you know, it was like, you know, kind of still drunk from that. But it's like, that was like the worst, one of the worst, like on the set. I mean, I felt so bad. And it's like, I drove, I drove my motorcycle and did those scenes. I did those scenes. I was hung over in those scenes. Wow. What? So you left your car there? And I left my car and it got towed. Like I just left my car there. It was towed to some, you know, some got towed to like a junkyard somewhere. And then I had like the next day, like take care. And I got it fixed. I got it fixed. And like, wait, I have to ask two quick follow-up questions. Number one, did the actress who played Suki, like, did she hold it against you for like how you were at the party or did she forget about it too? Oh, she forgot about it. Like, you know, I didn't get crazy. I was just like, yeah. I tried, I tried. And it was like, no. And then I wanted to go home. Like yeah. I was like, right, I forgot. And, like, I'll get out and then the second follow up question: Did Linda ever find out what happened, like with the car and all think, that? No, I don't think Linda ever knew that that what happened to me that night. I think <laughs> wow, that how, may be the best answer we've gotten to this question. One. That is a great. I never like fact. you know because it's like that's kind of like you know I look like a derelict, but this is nineteen. This is like nineteen eighty, right? So I'm like, well, I'm still like twenty four at that point. You but, were young. Everyone, yeah. oh trust me. If, if, Anything under the age of 30, you don't know what you're doing. What, Tim and I may not have worked in movies, but if you asked us to tell secrets about our 20s, it would. Be... I don't remember. Them. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember. Oh, that is. <laughs> wow. That is a great answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was for, a great. Thank and you. thank you so much just for doing this with us. It's been so much fun. Like you're so genuine and authentic. And it's just great talking to you about these films. We really appreciate it. Pamela Anderson inspire should inspire us all about being honest about your life. Boy, boy does she accept everything that happened. Right. Like, I yeah. Mean, good i think you just go good for them they're authentic and they don't you know they tell the truth you just go wow yeah it's a great documentary it, it, and also like own it like we all have highs and lows in our lives like nobody is perfect celebrities oh, aren't perfect i am sorry tim I'm is perfect. perfect yeah no but i mean people should own every part of their life because it makes you who you are today Correct. Right? i mean yeah. if maybe you hadn't i mean i don't even want it like if you hadn't had the experience driving through laurel canyon drunk maybe you would have done it again and something would have really bad would have happened no but you that's a that's a quick lesson to learn <laughs> that like my whole life could have changed that night yeah, yeah. Oh, not like nothing, you know, it could have been like just over. Like I could have got like the movie, everything that you could have did to the movie, like to yourself. It's like crazy. Like just one little, you know, again, I'm a dad. So one little decision that, you know, it was like I became a dad in 2006. One decision changes your whole life. I know. It's all crazy. Know that. Yeah. Crazy. So that well, night, I guess it's safe to say you had a hell night. <laughs> <laughs> That's Sorry. because you had a hell night. <laughs> oh. Um, Sorry. Um, okay, the so start of the movie, right? The opening, the opening shot is that girl screaming. You know, yeah. like that one big scream. Thank you so much, Peter. We'll be, okay. we'll definitely be in touch to let you know when the interview is going to be out. And again, this was so much fun talking with you. Thank you for taking the time. Yes. All right, guys. Okay. okay guys. All right. Take happy care. Saturday. Bye. Hey, you too. Yeah. Happy Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. This podcast is hosted by Tim Murdoch and myself, Matt Emmert. It's co-produced by Jacob Randall. 
We release new episodes every Monday and we switch off between reviewing new horror films with spoilers and interviewing horror stars. So there's something for everyone. You can listen to the podcast directly from our website. That's www.happyhorrortime.com or from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you stream podcasts. And if you'd like to support us, please sign up to be a patron at www.patreon.com slash happyhorrortime. Patrons get access to our monthly bonus episodes where we discuss past horror films according to a theme. They get to vote on those themes. They get our monthly newsletter, The Happy Horror Times, and autographed Happy Horror Time stickers. If you haven't already, make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Happy Horror Time. And since our movie reviews do contain spoilers, we always post the films we're going to review a few days in advance on our social pages, just in case you want to watch them beforehand and be in the know with us. And finally, if you'd like to contact us directly, send an email to happyhorrortime at gmail.com. We especially love it when you tell us how sexy we are. I'm Matt Emmert. And I'm Tim Murdoch. And we hope you have a happy horror time.